Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. So thrilled today to be joined by the fantastic Luke Goss, currently starring in the movie Hollow Point. And I love the way that when you take on projects, you always talk about how you really have to know what's the reason why I'm doing this. And so with this particular film, I actually wanted to ask what it was that you really felt this would specifically creatively fulfill in yourself to take on this role and be part of this project. I think it's trying to find those roles within whatever career you have. I think some actors are blessed to get you know, calls about these these faceted roles that sit within period pieces or an environment that's designed to really enjoy those moments. <clears throat> so I look for those roles within the offers I have. And so this film, I like the idea that he goes through, he's a man, he's dealing with his own demons. He's post those demons to a degree. He has a he has an, a moral code in some weird way. I think he's on a burnout. It's not like it's a backstory, really. It's not in the film, but I don't know how long he knows he'll be a part of that journey, although he wants to be maybe the guy that pushes the first snowball at the top of that hill. It's not necessarily the right way to do it. It's 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 it, it's right, it's wrong, it's it's all sorts of things, but it's it's the accumulation of a bunch of people that have lost just enough within a power system that uh, they've had enough. I think the facets, plus there was times where he was lighter. There was a physical element that felt valid within the story enough, you know, I, 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 and, I, and I thought there's enough to do here to see if I can, and there's a stoicism and I'm not, I, did, I wanted to see, because he's, it's an ensemble piece. So I wanted to see if I could bring some sense of leadership without barking orders and just having that, that trying to bring that stability, both for the audience to feel like, oh my God, is this going to, be disastrous, um, but this gives some sense of right in a wrong slash right weird world. And I just, I'm, I'm sometimes attracted to the idea of bringing that faceted idea to life <laughs> in a short window of three weeks on an independent movie. So it's, um, yeah, it's a challenge. And it's like wanting to put yourself through it for a moment to see, you know, say so one day to design all the fights. Can you memorize that? Of course, let's do that. And then the drama, then the lines and placing myself within a story it's an adventure that you know will be over in three weeks and it's worth swinging the bat at, so. Yeah, and because you were mentioning his moral compass, obviously there's the, the real juxtaposition of, you know, working within the legal system, but then the vigilante side of him as well. Um, and the fact that he really has to bend his moral compass a lot and that's constantly a moving line. So how is that really different to a lot of previous characters for you and just figuring out where his, where his limitations lay and where he would perhaps push them to based on certain circumstances? Well, we have to look at things in film to say, like, of course, you can't only make movies that sit so perfectly in everyone's moral compass. And you're know, you doing this or you don't. I'm like, that'd be silly. It's a movie. You know, I, I'm a spiritually driven man. I have great love for God. And, I'm a, and my main purpose is to see if I can help people. But when I'm not doing that, making movies, when you're sitting down with your food or your drink or your joint or whatever you're doing, you sit down, you want to make sure that you are entertained. You get a minute off. Um, the reason for this is, is justice and the expense of justice being applied the best it can? I don't think it is, no. I, I have been targeted, I've been a recipient of that as many people have. I think serve and protect, keep this community has to have a separate set of rules of processing to bona fide criminals. Um, seeing this go to his extreme frustration to this movie and say, um, I think it's a reason to do it, isn't it? It's a reason to play these parts. It's a reason to make them come to life. Um, because it does force with a hard bat sometimes a question. That's not how I personally would do it, but you, you have to know why you're sitting within a story and what it might say beyond just the pop the popcorn and the conversations while you're chatting, you know. But yeah, it's just, it's a big wide debate why you do film why I do films these days. Because because of music in my life, both of my brother and bros, my own personal solo stuff now. I'm a painter, uh, I'm a I'm a, I'm a writer. I just I have to find reasons to stop doing all those things. Uh, and go do a movie. So I know that was a long-winded, uh, disjointed answer, but I can't help myself. <laughs> no, it's, it's perfectly detailed. And you were mentioning a little bit before as well about some of the demons that he's carrying. And part of that is the fact that he lost his wife. And, and so do, was that kind of a really big driving force for a lot of the decisions and motivations that you built into him throughout the film? Without that, I wouldn't have done it. it, it it's a pointless story for me to be a part of. You know, when he says it, and even the guy when played by Dylan beautifully, he was kind of, oh, I'm sorry, man. He was like, he was in his own world. And the lawyer being experienced, Hank being experienced man as he was, he, his, he was fighting his own pain. 
it's a hard thing to do playing a masculine performance. And I'm going to say this, I love being a man and good men are out there. And it's great that dynamic between man and woman. It's the most glorious thing in there, that there is. I don't, I don't feel any uh, shame or discomfort saying it. I think there's no stronger union out there, but any, within love, I mean, wherever, you know, with that dynamic and he lost what he loved. Um, and trying to learn to move forward, to turn that anger into a fuel for change for others in a very, very misguided way, um, still has a point to it. The, he, he, Dylan's response, which was not so invested, showed that sometimes, dude, you just gotta, you gotta live with your demons within, not look at that man's suffering and his somewhat insensitivity. It wasn't delivered deliberately though, but the subtleties in there, I mean, it's, it, Walking past it was a hard thing for that character for me in my mind. And though I think about it, it's weird. I start thinking about his mindset, but it's, he, he's kind of on a, he's, I don't know if he's so terrified of the idea, idea that one of those bullets that he's going to get in the way of will bring him to his family. So I think it's a semi-death wish in a way with him, but he's going to do as much good as he can until he can't stand it. But I think he's... Um, He's not as healed as he looks. And I thought that idea to try and submerge that was a good, idea. It was a good challenge for me too, because I certainly understand about loss as we all do. Yeah. And I'm really interested in, in how you take a lot of details like that and other information that the script gives you as like a foundation to then really build a lot of backstory. And, and in particular, because you, you've mentioned in the past how part of your process involves making really, really in-depth and, and minute notes throughout the entire script, not just in terms of the big picture, but with really specific scene notes as well. So for this particular project, what did that look like in developing his backstory and the types of notes that were really useful for you to put down on paper as well? Oh, it's a great question. I, I feel so indulgent talking about the acting process, but if I'm asked, then I'm going to say, <laughs> I, I do this thing. I, it took me a long time to do this. I, I used to write down everything as proof as my dedication as an actor. So now I scribble on the script. I sometimes say, do not read. I read it once. So I know the movie I'm in. I know where it's at, but then I'll, once I'm sure that my character would be unaware of it, I say, don't read. I, I exit. I don't look at it because I'm thinking he would not be aware of this. He, he would have no clue of this. So the sooner I can lose this, I know the film I'm in, it's my responsibility. I learn both lines. I learn my actor, the actors opposite me. I learn my lines. I need to, so I can forget about all of it. it. I find the more information I can put, father's name, mother's name, was he abusive to her, to me, both, whatever. On and on and on and on and on. Minutia, 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 like ideas. So you, when you look around, as a theatre actor, you have to kind of zone out so much that the audience doesn't exist. You're in this place of your own planet, your own world. Within film, for me, if my mind is bombarded with so many things I've already put into it, then I'm, as a method actor, I don't have to learn my lines anymore once that's happened. I don't have to, I, I, I have no clue. I tell directors, you won't get, you will not see my performance until we roll. I would block, I would go through it, but I like the, the fear of, you know, you like, as a kid, we go up to that third diving board and jump off. Uh, you have to do it. You can't go down those steps. Uh, so I tell directors all the time, I, the, you know, like Guillermo del Toro, for example, credit to him. He will put, there'll be millions of dollars being spent on the fruition of a character that he's asked me to play. Not, not unfortunately, not in my direction, but <clears throat> certainly within the role. Um, and he won't ask me to show him the character. He won't ask me to see how he sounds. I discussed Blade Two with him. I discussed the throat. I said, you know, it'd be a, because it would affect his throat. So I love it, you know, but not one time does he see how he walks, talks, breathes or moves until the day of set and principal photography. Trust, communication, meetings, questions, answers. It's a glorious, complicated, process bringing say like a nomak or a nuada or, or, or a hitman that you it, what he's doing you, you think oh, this man's all for but the, the the what the director wants is we, we want people to love him at the end i'm like well thanks for that puzzle but with the way i'm made it's like it's that to me it's, it's like a hook in the mouth i'm like let's do it let's try it let's try it you know so it's a, it's a journey then acting when you're around people that are in love with film and there are not too many business people around that are looking at this if they're there but uh, you know i don't want to be near them but if you're around creative people in love with film, then you know what, you never know what you're going to get out at the end of it, but you've definitely got to throw some balls, swing some bats and see what happens. You know? 
Yeah. And within the complexity of that process, it's not even everything that you're just talking about in leading up to production and figuring out all those details. There's almost a second layer of what that construction looks like once you're actually playing the character, yeah. inhabiting them, feeling the fabric of, of the movement and, and working up against your scene partners. And so in working in a project like this, what was that secondary character development that then existed for you once you were on set? Well, Juju is a friend, so I was working with somebody who's a friend. Michael is a is a friend, and I'm I'm in awe of his acting. I think he's just he's just he's as rugged and as cool and as really. He's like, hey, so boom, he shows up, and that's how he is. And he's in his vibe. He's, you know, uh, let me do. I've got a name here, Bill Duke. I've always loved his work. Kirk uh, Kirk Fox, the uh, the comedian, was incredible. But I have to say, our bad guy, um, Jema, was just I, he just cre created this gravitas, and I think. I want to put the conversation in the same direction there rather than me is because what he, what he did in the villain in this film was make the movie a lot more valid and a lot more serious and a lot more, there was a lot more uh, jeopardy involved because he had a sociopathic, sociopathic way about him. But what people don't realize is the hardest thing about acting is to show zero acting is to relax your system and trust it and be in the zone so much that you there's not a layer of acting left. I don't care who, any actor out there listening to this will know that the expelling of that is a walk of, is a journey. We, we, you look at earlier work, you look at later work, you think, oh, thank goodness those days are over. Because <laughs> you have to watch a movie like this, you know. Um, but J-Mo did, did, just did a great job in this film. And I think the bringing that to life you're around people you know, and then you have to reach a point where you say, everything I stand for is gone. I don't get referred to as Luke in the entire shoot day. I don't come out of character with, unless it's when I'm on set, I don't let in with it. I do my thing when the day's over, when the lunch is over and that I'm all good, but I still need to stay in a zone, as did my, my cast members, you know, but it's, it's about saying, we're professionals. Now we must go full force into the world of this. And then the dialogue saying, one second, let us find our rhythms, there was a lot of experience on this set. So we, we were all saying, look, let's just find a, a little minutes. And the director, Daniel, who I love working with, just enjoyed the experience, sort of finding our little settling points, moving things. That was being on set all day because we were, we were moving at such a pace on this film. But, um, you know, we had a great producer, Adele. He was amazing and the director was great. And so, and lots of experience. And that's why this film got together so quickly. Yeah, it's such a joy to be around. That secondary dynamic is about how do we expel all of we know of each other and let's just, let's, let's just get in this world, you know. And with that point of, of really needing to stay in character and, and not breaking between shooting scenes for the entire day, has that been part of your process since the very first time that you did an on-screen project or is that something that you developed and evolved and realised was a real necessity over time? Yeah, it was the first movie I did was director Simon Monjack, God bless him, he's no longer with us, but he gave me my first role and he was a method set. So it was like, not, are you a method actor? He said, you will be a method actor on my set. <laughs> but, um, and I was playing the principal role as my first ever movie. Um, and in, at night I was on, an, on a motorbike cab heading to the West End of London playing Danny Zuko in Greece. So uh, drug addict by day, Danny Zuko went, oh, Sammy. <laughs> and then the day it was like dark eyes and tears and snot. And, um, but I realized it's the safest place for me to be as an actor's method. I don't like to use this word prostitute, my agony of life, the, le the death of my sister, my mother, my grandfather, the loved ones, that that's for the place, sacred place of healing and faith for me. Um, method means I can cry or whatever is needed or be in terror or anger or rage in regards to the moment of the script of the screenplay. So I was given the opportunity without choice to jump into this method world that day, years ago. Um, and you can very rarely get it wrong. You can only not get it right for the director. So you have to be directed, of course, but there'll always be truth in a performance that's method driven because you're in the moment. You don't know it's not real. You don't, your body doesn't really understand. You don't know what you've done until you see playback and you want to know where it was it felt real but sometimes you learn as an actor too real doesn't work cinematically so you make those adjustments too but it's it's a dance of learning acting and it's never ending i think there'll always be something i'm like damn it you know i mean 90 years old and i'm like oh that was too much or or whatever you know but that's the fun of it you put yourself out there
And you mentioned before, you know, the experience that everybody was bringing to set, but on, on the other end of the spectrum, Dylan Jay, who plays Nolan in the film, this was kind of his first time doing a, doing a feature like this. Mm. Um, and one of the great things about acting is, is the fact that people do come in with different perspectives and different stylistic approaches. And so I wanted to ask you about what he really brought to the table and, and that perspective that he was able to bring onto the set for you and the rest of the cast. I think, and I mean this without him in his life, I mean, purely within the confines of this discussion, he brought a naivety which was healthy for that role. I think um, he was young, so he responds in a way, like when I, when I get sadness now, it might just be, I drop my head for a moment. I'm like really saying, give me a second, I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> um, when you're younger, you, you throw plates and you do things. Um, I think age, um, ethnicity, his gentleness of his face. I think uh, the experience on set or the lack of, uh, he's a very polite man. He's a lovely guy. He's, a, he's clearly a, he's an actor that's, you know, working well and doing great things. He's a wonderful performance. But I think within the nuances, the, the, the deep laying minutiae of what would come through, I think some of that inexperience was really helpful for what we ended up having. Like when he said it, I said, why are you curious about the vigilantes? Like, you know, but when you have an older dude just staring at you, not blinking, thinking, no, I'm very, very serious. Um, that little discomfort kicks in, then we cut out. And then it, it, it all works. And I think, you know, fate is a beautiful, glorious thing if we surrender and just sort of let, let the tides of things work. I think it, this is one of those times a bunch of people got together and it, 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 20 days, poof, it was over. But uh, we did something, you know. And with Daniel Zerilli directing, what are the things that he would do in terms of the environment that he was creating on set and the way that he would really communicate with you as you were figuring out what these scenes were going to be, particularly because, as you're saying, it was such a fast shoot. So you had to be able to jump in and make really, really quick decisions for every single scene that you were shooting together. Daniel and I are friends. I mean, first time I worked with him, we didn't have a rapport at all. We didn't. I'd say, hey, what's up, man? I was in out for a day. We had time to know each other more in this movie. Got on really well. I, I, I'm sure I worked with him again at some point. But um, he brings an informality with him based upon, again, experience we were just talking about. He's made a lot of movies. He knows the set. He doesn't really feel intimidated at all, you can tell, which is always nice. Um, I think we have mutual respect for each other, which means our communications are two dudes. You have something you want to achieve. I always have a thing. I say, what does this scene achieve? What, what, where is it, what's the point of it? Where are we heading? What's the tone of it? What's needed? When you're not a producer on a movie, which I'm not, which I like to be, because it means I can open my mouth without saying, excuse me. <laughs> but I'll always say, excuse me anyway, but you know what I mean. Um, I, 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 you know, it's nice to, to, to have that position, but when you're not involved in writing or producing or directing, just an, technically an employee, it's nice to have a director that has respect for what you do, because then you can walk on and say, look, I'm here to conspire as Del Toro says to greatness. You know, we must look free to each other to say, you do what you do, I do what I do. Let's get this, let's do this the best we can within the time we have. Um, and, and he's one of those directors. He, it's discussion. There's no, there's no finger wagging with Daniel. And uh, I don't respond very well to those kind of guys anyway, in life or on set. But, um, <laughs> but he's good. He's fun to work with. He's a collaborator. And so I think that's, that's what I call him. He's a, he's a calm collaborator. He knows what he wants. And with that point about what are scenes there to accomplish, I actually wanted to ask about that in regards to the action scenes within the film, because you've obviously done so many of those types of scenes throughout your career. And it feels like within this, that the camera's right up there in the center, you know, that scene where you're taking on a bunch of the inmates, the camera never cuts away from you. So it actually allows you to focus on character a lot more in a different way. So were the two of you having conversations about the ways in which that was always part of the goal of those scenes was to really have that sense of character and story development and not just have it be okay we're cutting away to an action scene for a moment yeah i'll be honest with you as i'm not i'm not reti retiring from action film i, I kind of am i'm not I'm, I'm, i haven't said this much i've only just started talking about this i i have to really really now know both in remuneration director script the whole thing i i'm films had its way with me because i feel those conversations this that was a present in this film and it it's just the exacerbating factor that makes me say these conversations have to exist on set because if it does cut away to a fight scene for no reason, I can do that and it appeals, but I want it to be truly tethered to, ensconced, sewn to, welded to the story. And if it's not, then it should be shorter or not exist. Um, 
but again, when they happen, I want to be able to keep, for example, I did the tie thing again because it was more way I was frustrated. I'm like, you bunch of idiots. I know that if, if I take him down, you, you lot will all be Scarpering anyway. He knows the rules. Now, piss off. I got, wait, let's go see what's happening with this kid. It, it's 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 the, afterwards it's like you want to spend it in the hole he knows how it works he knows the procedures he doesn't feel like a hero he's frustrated he calls the guards he's like doesn't want it. he wants it handled before it does get silly but he doesn't feel threatened because he knows the rules the minutia so I thought how do I put that at the tail end of a fight before we go into a dramatic and and enable me to sort of simmer down no matter how used how capable he is he's still got adrenaline he's still got to center himself so there's and also I had to shoot that in I think we had an hour, an hour and a half to shoot that fight scene. And on a studio, that would be two days. So different worlds, different paces, but it feels good to be able to walk on set. I can, I can, I can do those things. So it's, you know, that's, if anything, I've got to super focus and in a suit, it's not always that easy, but I just thought, you know what, this is the bit that I can make everybody's day easier with. And then we, if I can get it, I had this little thing in me. I'm like, if I can get this done well, and fast, then I've given my director more of his day, which as a director myself, an hour would be an hour. If I can give him another hour, then, then I've helped his day. So that's just the way I look at it. And with the fact that you are a director yourself, um, I think it's really interesting the fact that when you first stepped into directing, that you talked a little bit about the way in which you wanted to feel that you had a certain amount of knowledge about film and about directing before you stepped into doing that. Yeah. And so what was that tipping point for you when you suddenly really felt that you were at that place that you were ready to make that jump for yourself? Well, I feel very appreciating of these kind of questions. They're really, really um, thought, thoughtful and I appreciate it. Um, Directing is like a captain of a ship. You, why, why take the wheel before you know how to? You're putting people in harm's way. It doesn't make sense. You're hurting their careers, you're hurting your own. You're hurting people's day and, and wasting the investors' money. Um, I think when I found myself being asked by directors quite often, where, where do you think, what do you think, you know, even I've had sets, no names mentioned, where I've directed scenes just because they were complex and people felt whatever. And the point of being a team player is that you go do that. You work, you know, I've got, you know, 80 movies under my belt, whatever it is, I don't know. But um, I think I'm in the business of being a friend and an ally uh, more than needing to, to think about it any other way. And with directing it, it you know, you are directing a movie. <laughs> You're the captain of the ship. And in one idea, I was the writer, director, producer, and lead actor. But I, I thought that way you can bring an ethos you can bring a family. I, I like things to stay chill. If someone's discordant this time around, I, I, they would be leaving my set. Um, it's the way it is. It's just peace and love, man. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? You owe it, I think. One owes it to the audience to try and create an energy beneath the film that was, was healthy. So energetically, they're watching. I'm a, I'm a very hippie boy, like spiritually driven lad. I, I think what sits beneath things should be authentic as well as the delivery. I don't. So uh, I felt ready when, when I'd been asked to help often, I thought maybe it's time to go and walk past my own little personal fears as we all have, whether it be the day that you became what you are doing. And you, you know, you sometimes you're sitting just, you're just a girl at home, aren't you? Sort of taking that deep breath, filling shoes in a matter of hours, but it doesn't mean you don't get home with that first day thing. I now I did that. Now I guess it's only going to become more of you every day after that. But um, I think we all sit in the same stories, just different shapes and different players, you know. Yeah. And with that idea of sitting in stories, you know, across the board between directing and producing and acting, you've got music, painting, you've also written books. And I think what's fascinating about working in such a plethora of storytelling facets is the fact that they all require such an internalized creative process in slightly different ways. But what do you find are the connective threads that really tie that together in terms of that internalization that all of these artistries require of you? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> um, I think the enlightening catalyst genesis for the new version of me would be paint. Strange enough, because it's just me. It takes me weeks to do one. I just painted 18 pieces back to back. I got totally overwhelmed with this 
I don't know, is that an outpouring? I've never painted in my life. Never, 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 never. I did a painting called A Light Depiction of Jesus Christ, but I always wanted that to be the first thing if I ever did. And I realized philosophy sits so deep in paint for me. I like to find a construction process that is difficult, an idea that is simple, layers, thinking four or five days, planning the building process of it, color planning and all that. But what it's really designed to do is to expel, exercise thinking of them from me to say, put it onto an internal form of something. It represents my ethos, it represents my philosophies, my spiritual beliefs, but it also more importantly than any of it, evokes conversation. And I realized that now that set the standard. So I've just been writing some songs on my little hippie Instagram, 50,000 people, whatever it is, but I've been singing my tunes and they've been tethered to healing of myself and others painting, film, conversations. The depth of the communications I've been having today about this little movie has been glorious because I think we're all so hungry for each other and in, in, in uh, exploring how we're dealing with this. I, I, I ask people so, so respectfully to, to, to make sure they don't come out of this the same, the same way. And so film now has become put on that very, very, very strict list of why, you know, it's, it's not a farewell, but it, there is a shape change for me. I won't be doing these kind of movies anymore, not because I don't love them, but I need to truly, truly understand why I would be pulling myself away from paint, guitars, hand pens, books, writing, and everything else I'm doing. So if anything, more love is going to be entering the room because it, sh it will be even more precious to me from this day onwards. But film is going to be less frequent, for sure. Maybe one, maybe two if I'm blessed a year. Um, but so many changes have come from this recent time. Creativity has to be, I think it's a voice, not mine, of course, but creativity, if you look through history, is enduring. And, and strangely enough, becomes the defining element of history. So if we look at how people dress, how people were, we find ourselves looking at history, at art in any form to give us an unbiased opinion of it. Um, and I, so I think it's a precious thing. And so I, I see, I, I'm, I'm turning crispier by the day, I'm 52 years old, so I have to start putting a precious wall around what I do to know why, and to, to also ask the other question, the other half of me will be about philanthropic and my own time efforts to see how I can make people, people feel more loved and secure in this very crazy time. I think that's also interesting to hear, and thank you so much for, for such a great conversation. I love, love talking to people like you have open minds and have taken time for this interview. It's very, very honoring and I appreciate it. Thank you.